All right, we are here on the podcast uh, with David from We Banjo Three and uh, a fantastic group. I'm actually I've always wanted to see you live, never seen you live, and uh, but I actually found you for the first time because I'm uh, I own a theater here with my family and I'm the entertainment director and I'm always searching for for new shows mm. and. Uh, I was scouring some site and and your your group came up as performing. I started doing some research and I was just like, I went on a, a bender for the whole night. It's like, I love these guys. You were fantastic. Um, and I'm a big bluegrass fan. I'm a fiddle player, of course, but uh, um, it, you're such an interesting take on, on you, you can't, it's, you're a hard group to classify. And I'm sure you get that all the time where, it's bluegrass, but it's Irish, but it's yeah. this, but it's that. And it just blends and works so well together. Um, a great group. But cool. nice to have you on the podcast. And it's really nice to have you. Uh, and we should have a, a great conversation. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. No problem. So you're in New Hampshire right now, some snow and enjoying the the winter. Um, but uh, yeah, I, go ahead. I lived I lived I lived in Nashville for the last four years, and then I decided that I wanted the tropical winter weather of New Hampshire, so I moved up here. So what was it like living in Nashville for you? Did you enjoy being in Nashville? I did. I think that that town, it does two things. For me, it did two things. It it taught me a lot of humility. Yeah. <laughs> There's nothing like moving to that town to, to kind of show you what music really is that it's not just being able to play really really well that's not i think prior to moving to nashville maybe i had the illusion that being a really really good player was what being a musician was about um and moving to a city in which i guess every single person is amazing like the person pouring your coffee is probably a better guitar player than you yeah person who's uh, you know pulling your pint in the in the pub is probably an amazing song, songwriter so it it pulls you away from this idea that you're you're really you know you're really skilled therefore you are a musician and it draws you more into the idea of mu being a musician is is an artistic path it's more of a community it's more of a how you are as a person not just how you play um yeah and i remember uh an older musician turning to me one time uh, I asked the question, I said, why are all these musicians in Nashville so nice? Like, why are they all so nice? And he said, because there's loads of really good, there's re loads of really good musicians. There's loads of really good musicians. And then there are a number, there's a few musicians that are really good and really nice. And that's who you want to work with. Yeah. So the first thing was the complete, you know, ego crush and obliteration of any ideas I had about myself. <laughs> And the second one was community. It was, it was like you could leave for eight weeks and come home and meet a friend of yours and you didn't get the, it wasn't weird. It wasn't odd. It's just that everybody is in such a transient lifestyle that, you know, going on tour and coming home and, you know, I'm picking up friends from their tour bus when I'm getting off, you know, my Uber from the airport picks up them from their tour bus and we go for a drink after, after we both get home. That's just a very interesting thing to share with somebody and i think that town was really good for that as well it really it was a really it's a really deep community you know yeah it's like really unlike any other place that i know um you know new york is a music yeah. town la is a music town to some degree but it's not the community like you have because it's a smaller knit group of people um there is that mm. tightness there and and uh and that's really important. I mean, I think, especially now with everything going on um, in the world, that it's good to have that community as well because, you know, everybody's kind of going through stuff together. It's interesting. And an under, what I would say, an underground diversity of music. Like, when I moved to Nashville, I thought it was all country music. And when I got there and spent some time there, I realized that there's so there's such a diversity of the music that's in that town there's a lot of people who play in country music bands obviously this it's a country music town yeah 
but there's also this really deep scene of soul, R&B, blues, jazz, jazz fusion, bluegrass, Americana, all these genres that, that are in this dance in that town, which, you know, and then for some reason during the summer, I decided I wanted the woods. So I moved to New Hampshire and I have a small studio in the woods out here. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> which is what you do in a global pandemic. I think that's what you do. Yeah. Well, that's true. It, it's good for that. It's funny that you were saying about uh, musicians and, you know, so many of them were nice. And I, I really found that as a growing producer when I was younger and, and working with a certain amount of guys that always were friends and they were great and, and kind of took that leap forward and started hiring really big guns to come in and be the guys in the studio. And I was always really nervous about that because I didn't know how that was going to be, right? I didn't know if they were going to be... Mm -hmm you know, overtake the session or look down upon you or whatever you, you know, you kind of just dealt a bunch of things. And then I decided to go for it. And I sort of hired all the A guys um, that I could on the session. And it was life changing. It was like one of the best moments of my life. Because mm -hmm. um, they were all say, like you said, they were all super nice. And they treated you at the same levels, what they were at. Um, and there was just no weird attitudes or they were just comfortable with what they did. They were really great. And, and that was it. Yeah. It's, it's, I think everybody has a magic sauce in their music. And maybe if this is to expand past just Nashville as a town, I think that every, every person, every musician has a special sauce. They have something that's, you know, and often I think what we do is we take the thing that we're special for, the thing that's our special sauce, and we bury it in the deepest parts of our soul because we wouldn't want anybody else to actually know that that's there. And yeah. that's another thing that when you look at that world, what you realize is that your weirdness, your thing that's kind of odd and maybe not mainstream and not, you know, normal in inverted commas or whatever, that's the thing that makes you stand out and i think that's what i found about nashville as well is that you see the musicians and the singers and the and that that really just spark you and they often have something kind of just odd just a little quirk a little weirdness and it's the acceptance of that oddness and the weirdness that is what drives their brilliance and i i had thought that for me living there Again, living there as an Irish person as well, which is a, a, a unique perspective, I think, on the world. Of what we've always said, there's nobody who doesn't like the Irish. Yeah. You know, there's like lots of different other countries. They have like, you know, quarrels with one another. Everybody celebrates St. Patrick's Day. Yeah. Everyone's like, hey, <laughs> March 17th, you want to go get a green beer, you know? And that's, that's a unique perspective and probably a unique privilege to view the world through. And I think that for years, I tried to bury parts of myself that were Irish oh, yeah. because I didn't, I was nervous to lean into the, and by burying the real parts, what took place, what took their place were the shadow parts. And that's the, the bits that are not really real. They're not, they're like the a priori Irish man. And I think that, you know, you have artists like Hosier and David Keenan and Eve Regan, you have all these amazing uh, Susan O'Neill all these amazing artists rising out of Ireland now that have a very deep uh, very deep version of being Irish and I think that's really inspiring because I think I've seen that in Nashville as well and I've seen that I'm sure you see that in, in the Toronto music scene um, and New York all these all these towns you see that that's when people when you get that many people together and you put you you really get them into the think tank what what people start to get really comfortable with is who they authentically are rather than trying to push down the authentically the authentic part of yourself yeah. and give rise to the maybe i don't know what we'll call it but the it's the easy sell part of you you know yeah and i think that that's maybe what it, the scariest part about nashville was that people saw through that pretty quick yeah do we have someone else joining uh okay no, I guess someone looked like someone joined our podcast or our Zoom and then left again. 
had someone come in. Come on in. <laughs> I know. So someone's name I didn't have a chance to pick it up. It's like, who else is here? <laughs> That's great. God is God. Is <laughs> so, so what's your quirkiness? Like every, you said, everyone has their little quirkiness. What's what's your thing? Oh, is there really a, kind of, is I there really led to that. I, <laughs> there's probably a pretty a pretty li- a pretty big list at this point. I think that. I think personally for me, the thing that I've, maybe it's not my quirkiness, but it's the thing that I found the hardest to lean into is being comfortable in my art as an artist, not just based on how, how good I can play. Yeah. I think the mentality that I grew up with was that I had to be a really, really good player. And that was paramount. Yeah. That the most important part was being able to do as many triplets as I could in a row to never miss a note, play as many chords, as many treble strums, you know, play the bass and the guitar at the same time. Hey, throw in the stomp and some synth pads while you're doing it and sing. Do all that together. And I thought that that's what being a musician was, but it's not. That's impressive at a time and it's impressive for a short spell. It's kind of like someone juggling, riding a unicycle. It's wow, you're like, wow, that's really impressive. But two hours into that show, you're pretty bored. Yeah. Whereas someone reading poetry that they've written from their heart, that has meaning, that has depth, that has history, that has soul, you would listen to that all day. And I think that that maybe was what the, what the thing that I was most uncomfortable that I had to overcome was I don't have to just be, I don't have to like hang on being impressive. And I think that maybe I speak for the entire band when I say that is like, and I feel so lucky. Like I am the youngest in the band, I'm the singer, and by no means am I even remotely close to the most talented in that band. Like We Banjo 3 is such a joy to be in because I look around at the people I get to play music with and they are some of the best, in my opinion, some of the best musicians that I've ever, ever played with. Yeah. Martin, my brother on mandolin and banjo, is this All-Ireland winning banjo player and mandolin player. Incredibly, like, versatile and, in like, he, you know, is just this amazing musician. Fergal Scal plays fiddle like nobody I've ever, I've never played with someone like Fergal before. Yeah. The way he reads music in his mind, the way he puts that tapestry together. End of scale, the same thing. This banjo pyrotechnic, you know, written books on it. And so for me, sitting in that group, often, I think, again, when I was younger, I was nervous because I was like, I'm not, I don't have that. I play guitar and I sing. Because <laughs> nobody else will sing in the band. And I think as the time has gone on, that's the, that's maybe the change in the band is that we've all realized that playing really well is not, it's not the thing. It's not about technique. It's not about the a million notes per second. It's about what are you like, what are you feeling and how are you transmitting that? And what are you, what are you putting out there for somebody else in the audience? And we, some of our music is based around mental health because that, for me, for a long time, was the only thing I could really comment on. It was the only real deep experience that I felt like I had the right to comment on, yeah. from my own perspective. Yeah. Um, and so we, some of our songs were about mental health, and it, those were really eye-opening because they were s- so simple. Like we have a song called "Don't Let Me Down," and I, it's I finger pick a four-string banjo, and it's four-part harmony, and. For me, it's one of the most magical moments in the night to sing that song because there's no crazy banjo licks, there's no crazy fiddle and there's no stomp or there's no massive horn part. Sometimes we travel with a a horn section and there's no big horn part in that. It's just a simple song about feeling something that is difficult to traverse through, this transient um, liminal space that we end up in. And how do you get through that? And that's all it is. And again, that was that that's been I'm still trying to learn that. I can guarantee when all this uh when all this is over and we go back to playing shows, I will return in some way to that nervousness that I'm not I'm not flashy enough. I'm not I'm not playing fast enough. I'm not playing good enough. And I it's like a constant thing that I have to remind myself that it's not about that. It's about connection. It's about authenticity. And it's about yeah. having someone in front of you who's feeling something and being able to connect 
in a much deeper way than just by impressing them. Yeah. Great talk there. I mean, I think what you said can resonate with a lot of musicians. I think, you know, as musician people really look at being approved by, by other musicians. It's important to us that totally, yeah. someone else that who's a musician um, approves of what we do, but they're not the ones who are buying tickets yeah. to come see you. So it's an odd thing to and, kind of, to look at yourself saying, all these people over here are the ones I'm trying to impress and probably none of them are going to come and buy an, a ticket to come see our show. But all these other people yeah. who, who are going to give up their money that they work hard for to go have a great time and see this great group and, and have lasting memories of that particular performance, you kind of forget that, oh, I'm supposed to be actually working for those people. Um, it, but it's, yeah. it's tough because you want to, we want this approval, right? We want to know that our peers think that we're actually good at what we do. And, and it's, a, it's yeah. a weird disconnect. And it's, it's all through um, the music industry, even as an audio, engin audio engineer, that I have to watch myself that if I go out to a, sh a mix sometime for a show, that I'm not too concentrated on making sure that the audio crew that's at the venue thinks that my mix is great. Um, it's, yeah. I, I got a mix for the audience. So maybe you're not going to have the best yeah. mix in the world. Um, but it's, maybe it's perfect for an audience, maybe because they're older yeah. or they're something. So you mix something differently so that they have a great experience from it. Maybe the guy next to you is not going to mix like that. But we're also judgmental um, I, on each other on certain things like that. And I think it's... It's it's hard to get past that, and and but you have to, you know, to make it work. And that that probably falls into the space of what like quality quality is such a arbitrary figure. Yeah. Like to do a really great mix, we have this we have we travel with our sound man Frank Marchand. We love him. He's amazing. He's he like listens to what we need. He like he loves the show. He dances every night while he's mixing the show. He's like, oh, I know there's this line on the banjo, and I'm like, he's ready. And it's like the joy he gets in that. And I know for Frank that he has that same stress, even now after like six years of touring with us. It's like if there's a bad show, if there's a show that just you know something didn't really click, or you know sometimes you just have weird nights where you come off and you're like. Yeah. Everyone clapped and everyone was happy, but why did it feel weird? Frank is the first to blame himself. And I, and I I think that that concept of quality is such an arbitrary out there in space figure that it's not even worth it's not cuz I can guarantee I can guarantee I know like when you hang out with the real top of the top musicians and that, like these again back to the Nashville point when you hang out with these insanely good musicians they're more generous and they are more understanding of of quality as a bigger idea than just playing the thing really well or mixing the thing really well they understand the art they actually maybe can stand back from it maybe it's like you know you want to be famous until you're famous and then you don't want to be famous because it's you realize that being famous was not worth it jim carrey yeah. talked about that and maybe the same thing is with those like ron block is a guitar god a banjo, banjo god yeah. you know Alison Krauss in Union Station has like the Ron Block sound. Yeah. And I remember sitting and having coffee with Ron before and him talking about other musicians. And it blew my mind because he was picking out things that he enjoyed in their playing that were like not based on their technique or not based on their like, perf like perfect performance. He was talking in such like a soulful way about it that it was like, oh, and here's this person who's like, like plays each note as if it's like worth a million dollars. Yeah. And I, and I, I, I do think that that is an interesting, I think it's a cult and I think it's a cult within music, a cult of perfectionism that we're, I, th I think we are rising out of it ha like pop music and country music are like a real showcase of that. We're like the sound of country and pop and bluegrass to some extent and a lot of other records 
because they are led and shaped by popular culture. Yeah. It was like note perfect. Isolation, everybody's in their own iso booth. If you play one note wrong, we're going to get in there with Melodyne. We're going to fix it. We're going to overdub everything. And what I think what's coming back now, and definitely one of my, my favorite albums, have more of a live feeling. They have more of like an in the room. Not everything is perfect. Not everything is like, not every, you're not in on the grid, like lining up everything, like picture perfect. It's a, it's a little loose and there's a little duende, there's a little wabi-sabi, whatever you want to call it. There's a little something in there and that's where the magic happens. And I think, I would hope that that's the major direction that the entire music industry goes towards because I think it will end up in better art. It's the singer-songwriter on stage who only knows three chords, yeah. but they can play those three chords and they can sing and believe in that with the most amount of heart. And then you sit, if you take that person and you put them beside a person who knows nine million chords and is really in their head, those one of those is going to make you feel something, which for me is the primary thing of music. Is it should It should get you... It's, it's a connection, but it's like tying a string on your heart and handing the other side of the rope to somebody and saying, hey, you want to you wanna do this? And I think that that's a much, for me, a much more rewarding side of music than the perfect perfection. The, yeah. The search, the search for perfection. Well, when it comes down to, and there's no disrespect at all to an audience, um, but the audience isn't that smart. Um, as far as mm. knowing what's going on. Um, and I've seen it over and over again at our, my own venue here where I can sit day after day, do, uh, we're open in the summer for six days a week. We do 120 shows, you know, and it's like, bam, 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 bam. And it's just people coming in shows, people coming in shows, bam, bam, bam. And you, so you, but you get this repetitious and checking to see, what people really gravitate to. And some of the most popular musicians or people that come in um, and people kind of come up to me afterwards and say, man, that, that drummer was fantastic or that keyboardist was just amazing. Almost every time I've heard that, they were singly the worst player in the band or possibly one of the worst players we had in the venue that season, but they made interesting. They made up for it with this other stuff, right? Which was their the way they played, the way they looked. Um, they could be looking like they're having the best time in their lives, and there just be something about them that just you can't stop watching them. But mm. it's not translating to people that they're not really that great of a player, and. I've had shocking moments yeah. where I've had people come up where you're like, oh my God, we're going to have complaints because, you know, this drummer is really bad and, and you know, played <laughs> wrong as a fill-in drummer or something. And then all of a sudden I'll have people come up, man, that drummer is fantastic. And it's like, you sit and go, what? Yeah. And, but for their eyes, it's, it's not, you know, it's all senses firing when you're watching a group play and, you're smelling the audience, right? It's part of you and it's, it's your sense of everything and you're watching the dynamics of what's going on on stage. Mm -hmm. And that's what attracts people. It's, they're, they're drawn to that excitement that, that happens on stage and stuff can happen. Yeah. And you know, you've probably been through it where a lot of times you even mentioned, you thought you left, left the stage and said, oh man, I played some pretty crappy notes or I wasn't singing in tune uh, as well yeah. as I usually do. And who notices? Um, you know, or you're nervous because that usually, yeah, and it's just it isn't as important. And even as a sound guy, uh, going out too, it's not important that the mix is perfect. Um, yeah. and you know, how many times you go to a, a concert where he's like, Oh man, that's a great concert, the mix kind of sucked, and, but you, you, you can walk out with 20,000 people out of a stadium and you never hear one person say that besides a couple musicians that were in the audience who he, who may know sound. But you, I've never had anyone well, walk out of concert and say, that mix sucked. Yeah. Well, maybe maybe that, 
maybe then I'll challenge your original point and say, maybe the audience is way more intelligent than any of us. Well, like, yeah. Because for us, because for us, we think, right, again, we go back to our like view of quality and we say, well, that drummer sucked. That's us as musicians looking in on it and saying, on a very technical basis, that drummer sucked. But it's like if you re relate it to art and you relate it to a canvas and you have these painters who are mental, they're crazy. And when they, when they, in their time, they were nuts. People were like, that's absolutely nuts. That makes no sense. But they, their paintings have stood the, st the test of time. Same thing with writers. I mean, if you read, um, if you read literature, a lot of the time, those like Emily Dickinson wasn't, she wasn't a big poet in her time. It was long after her time that she like, you know, really came on, uh, you know, and I, I wonder if, if, going back to that idea that maybe the audience is actually really smart is what the audience are searching for and what a musician is searching for are two different things. Because what a musician is searching for is a comparison. So as a musician, I sit and I listen to a guitar player and go, wow, he or she is really good compared to the arbitrary idea of quality that I have in my mind based on how I play. Because, you know, I'm an Irish guitar player primarily, an Irishy, bluegrassy, um, I mainly play with a pick, you know, I, you know, play dad gad tuning. I have this weird bass system. So in my vision, I'm not like overly complicated chordally. I'm more on like a rhythmical kind of like, I see myself as part of the rhythm section more, mostly in a, in, in, yeah. in a kind of a band situation. So if I'm listening to a finger style guitar playing guitar player, I probably have a better, I probably have a better chance of seeing the quality actually for what it is versus someone who does something similar to me. Because if someone is playing who does something similar to me, I am now judging them off my own idea of myself. And from an audience perspective, they're there to feel something and be entertained and to be in space with other people and just have a good time. Yeah. And I think that maybe if we really, if we as musicians and producers and engineers st actually stood back for a second and realized that's actually it because at, at the end of the day that's the system that's how it works like i i can i can play again it goes back to that original idea of like it's it's not how fast you can play or how well you can play it's like it's the soul you bring to it yeah. and i wonder if just the audience has a, because of the group mentality of an audience, they're not walking in with preconceived notions. Like an audience is not trying to judge the quality of the other player. They're just sitting there being like, this is great music. I'm really enjoying this. Yeah. And I, I think that that group mentality brings the audience intelligence far higher than any individual musician could ever be. And again, it comes out. It's like, I don't know how many times... You know, it has probably, it's happened to us tons of times. You make an album and then you pick your singles. What's the first three songs we're going to release off this album? Yeah. And you never get that right. Yeah. You never get that right. No musician in the history of the world has ever gotten that right. Because they, you release the ones you like, this is the one. This is the song that everybody will like. This other song, we're going to put it on the album. Nobody's going to listen to it. And every time. Every time you are wrong, or we're wrong at least. And I'm sure that's happened to so many. And so I, I, there's a part of me that really is in awe of the audience. Yeah. Like I actually worship at the feet of the audience because, and not in a way that I need their approval all the time. Again, maybe that was another stepping stone that I felt like I, because I, I was 19, 18 when, I, when we started this band. Um, so I was pretty much, I, I just pretty, pretty much just out of college um, I just a fresh drop out of out of college, and I hadn't really had that much experience in life in general yeah. um, when we started the band. And so I feel like I actually kind of grew up in this band, and I definitely wanted the audience approval for like that first solid eight years of the band. Yeah. And it's only now I can sit back and be like, I don't want their approval, but what I do worship at the feet of is that they are they are competent and very confident. To, to see through my 
Yes. Not sure if we're allowed to swear on this podcast. Sure. So I'm going to use BS because <laughs> I'm not sure if you have the big, I was kind of hoping that you'd have a big red button. That would be amazing. But I know, I know that they will see through that. They like, I know that because it's happened. And I know for a fact that when my mental health wasn't very, very good, I tried to put on a mask and stand out there on stage and they saw through it. They didn't, it didn't connect. I didn't connect with them because the gateway wasn't open. Yeah. And if I've learned anything in the very short and humble amount of time that I've been doing this, if the only thing that I've learned up to this point is that I cannot be anything else other than myself, not because it's not possible, but because it is possible, but they'll know. They're like the audience's collective perception of someone with a mask on is exceptional. Like they will, they see it and they respond to it immediately in one way or the other. And the worst gigs in my life have been the ones that I've been the most hip top shape, vocals warmed up, lots of rest, start of a tour, ready to do it. The best gigs of my life are like, you know, I have the flu and <laughs> Yes. someone in the van is in hospital currently you know the van broke down on the way to the show and i have five strings on my guitar go yeah. you know that's those are the best shows because you actually like when my voice is almost blown out those shows are those shows are the ones that people walk away from being like that was something special yeah because i i have nothing i have nothing more than just like the bottom five percent of my meter is all I have left. And so that's all I can give people. Yeah. And that honesty, I feel it. From my perspective, it's it's not a good show from their spe- perspective maybe, but it's the best show of my life from mine because it's all I have, you know? Yeah, I could totally relate to that. I've had probably some of my best shows um, sicker than a dog, you know? Or there's something <laughs> about that when you've... Here's the way. Yeah. It is. You just kind of all of a sudden you're like you have to find something to get through it, right? It's like, how am I ever going to go on stage and do this? But you get out there and you dig for something that you don't normally dig for um, because you don't think you need it. Um, And you walk off and and people are like, wow, that was fabulous. I thought you were sick. (laughs) But yeah, it's, it's that, it's, that's what it is. It's when you, you go out confident and feel really strong about, where you are, you don't dig for that extra because you feel confident no. already, but it's that time where you dig deep for, for that. And as you said, there's nothing, there's no focus on anything else. You just hundred percent focus on, I have to get through this, that there's no other thing yeah. that will block your, your brain and, and make you twerk out somewhere else. So yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's pretty cool oh. that you said that. I've ex- totally experienced that myself. I imagine as a producer as well, like I'm, I like I don't I I do my own like recording at home and I do my I have in my own studio, but I don't produce other artists. But I've been around people who who like you are sitting in rooms with artists, and it I think it applies in that scenario too. That's why we love Frank so much. Mm-hmm. Frank is an ins, he's an insane man. He's like he's 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 brilliant at what he does. And we, we, we argue so much. So the person I argue the most with in the band is Frank, not my brother, not, yeah. not these guys that I've known. It's Frank. We clash heads all the time, but I love the guy. Yeah. Because when it comes to sitting in a room and making an album, Frank is just Frank. It's just himself. And it allows me to just be me. And it allows Enda and Fergal and Martin we just, let's just be ourselves. And I, and I think from, from my side to your side, maybe that producers, when you, like, like you, when you are honest with us, when you are maybe, when you are deep in who you are as a person, it just, that stretches out to the whole room. Everybody in the room now is like, okay, I'm on that level. Let's do it. Let's just sink down into who we are. And all it takes is for one person to start putting on a mask and then everyone else is like oh shit should i be doing that maybe i should do that oh yeah that seems like a good idea and that's why i think that the 
if it's it, then it's probably a different point i think the magic in every band has to be protected yeah i think that every band scenario no matter who it is the people that you do that with they'll rub off on you like you share you share the evil and you share the goodness and yeah. if if someone if someone is pushing in that evil if someone's not really in it for the right reasons or they're they're coming in with their own emotional baggage it just it spreads like wildfire and yeah. so again i feel very fortunate again to go back to the other point of like not only are these guys that i get to play with every night not only they're fantastic musicians but they're way more experienced than i am they have way more tolerance and way more of <laughs> a clear view on it than i have and i so i do feel lucky i would have been I don't know what would have happened to me if I had just hadn't had the support and structure of the band when I was 19. You know, I was kind of a bit crazy. Like I was dealing with a lot of emotions that I didn't have names for or ideas about how to process. Yeah. I probably would have just been like, and I think I see now why there's so many musicians who escape into alcohol and drugs because without some sort of structure or some sort of, I suppose, like safety mat of these people who will hold you accountable for your shit. Yeah. Beep. Uh, sorry, I, <laughs> I feel like I should have the... Yeah. <laughs> Looking around to see if there's anything red that I can use as a red button for myself. It's all good. But without having, without having that, I, I, I can see... I can see why musicians, because again, if we're talking about this authenticity side, and we're talking about this like walking out on stage and actually being yourself, you add the struggle and the like the weirdness of like an artist's life and the inconsistency, the lack of sleep, the being away from home, the access to large amounts of drugs and alcohol, you add all that together and it's it's like a ticking time bomb. So unless you have the right people in your band, again, it's like the aggregate of everybody in the band. Yeah. If that ends up net positive, you are in the best band. Yeah. But there's a lot of bands that it doesn't. And, you know, people get pulled into the weeds all the time. Yeah, it's like being in a bad relationship. And lots of times those musicians just go from one bad weed to the next bad weed. <laughs> and sort of like they just get stuck and... And they may zip to the next band, but it's just as bad a place as it was in the last band. Uh, but that's what they're attracted to, right? It's just what, for some reason, right? So, um, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, the relationship comment is actually amazing. That's a brilliant analogy. So let's talk about the band. Maybe go back a little bit, you know, growing up. What got you? Uh, obviously, your brother uh, is a fabulous musician. Uh, was he the reason why you started playing or was it, it's, um, what got you into actually playing? You know, I got into playing music in a very interesting way because I think the opportunity was everything, the moment of opportunity. So me and Martin, it's just, we're, we're Martin is my brother in the band. There's just, there's just the two of us in, in our family. Um, and our dad played guitar and sang all of our lives. Yeah. Amazing singer, amazing guitar player, really gentle soul, just like heart of gold. And so we, as kids, obviously, as young, very young kids, he would sing to us all the time and play music for us. And then I would, th I would have thought that that's how I would have started playing music myself, but it wasn't. I I had a childminder when I was a kid. You know, I, my brother would go to my grandmother's after school and I would go um, to Mary McGann, this woman who was friends of, friends of our parents and she was my childminder. And it just so happened that one, one of her kids was starting music lessons and Mary was like, do you mind if I just send David with him? Because, you know, he's, my kid's gone, your kid could go. And Martin pretty much did the same thing. So all of a sudden, me and Martin were like playing music for the first time. But in this like really, like really like gentle, like you can go to this if you want. You don't have to if you don't want to. Yeah. Not in a, your father was a musician, so you'll be a musician. That was never part of our narrative. Yeah. It was always like 
yeah, you want to do that? Great. If you don't, cool. And we just got really into it. And uh, Merton's, I think Merton's first, he played, we both played Tin Whistle and Merton's first instrument was flute, actually. He's a fantastic flute player. Mm -hmm. um, and which is very strange for a man who now plays only string instruments. Yeah. <laughs> and my first instrument was actually ma was mandolin. Yeah. Um, the first like instrument other than a tin whistle that I had gotten was a mandolin. And I think, again, the brothers, Martin's three years older than me, and we really have a very good close relationship for all of our lives. Yeah. Uh, so we just kind of like, you know, we had different instruments. We had a rock band for a while where Martin was the drummer. Uh, and I was the electric guitar player and singer, and I was I pl I was the drummer in a rock band for a while and another rock. So we always had this like constant rotation of random instruments in our house that we got to play, again. But there was never like this. You will play this. Like this is. We, there was no directive from above. We didn't have that parental pressure to play music. So it was always like fun, and we were lucky to be able to play Irish music as well, which they could really communal type of music to be playing. So we would play, go to these sessions as like 10 year olds, we would be falling asleep in some pub in East Galway at like four o'clock in the morning after playing like 12 hours of tunes yeah. with these other people our own age and, you know, sitting in with sessions with, I remember sitting in with in a, in a session when me and Martin were kids and the people we were playing with were probably 70 years older than us like these people were so much older yeah but it didn't matter we were all just playing music yeah and again so i think we were lucky that our entryway into music was from a very like heart heart forward this is about enjoyment and this is about you know enjoying the actual act of playing music rather than your dad was a musician so you have to be a musician so i do feel like we were very fortunate and then, yeah, banjo came up, and I, I think the, the the instrument where my brain clicked with music was definitely guitar. As soon as I picked up guitar, I played lots of other instruments like baron, banjo, mandolin, and drums, and all these other instruments. Yeah, and I loved them. I played double bass for a time, oh, yeah. which was a wild like six weeks <laughs> uh, of being the up, the upright the double bass player in a youth orchestra yeah i couldn't read music i still don't read music i'm pretty sure they just had me there because i was 12 years old and six foot one <laughs> but then i picked up the guitar and it was like oh this is the first time this all makes sense it's like for some people it's the keys of a piano Mm -hmm. And they sit down the keys of the piano, they see it linearly, they can see there's a there's a low note and a high note and there's all this other stuff in between. For me, that was guitar. As soon as I picked up guitar and pl started playing chords, I realized that, that the colors that I saw in my head when I, when I thought about music, the system that I had devised in my head about how to like play music and how to listen to music and how to feel music, it like, it all made sense for the first time. It was like, Oh, this makes sense now. And since that, I just haven't been able to put down the guitar. That's awesome. So, when you were younger, was there uh, anything else you thought you would wanted to be besides a musician? Was there something you know you thought, oh, I really want to be fireman or something? You know, was there anything that you know that you did you think you were going to be a musician right from yeah. a young age? Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Again, both me and Martin were. And I mean, this, uh, Enda and Fergal both had different, we all did different things before the band. I mean, Martin is a, has a master's in, uh, in ar uh, artificial intelligence and a first class degree in civil engineering. Martin's a civil wow. engineer, qualified, Jeez. and like has a master's, uh, like has a teaching degree. I was in, I was in college to become a, a mechanical engineer. Yeah. Like we all did different things. Like our, our world was like, you know, AutoCAD <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and like science experiments, you know, concrete density, like that's, that was our old world. And, and I think that up until seven years ago, that's what I thought I was going to do. I didn't think music was my career. Yeah. I didn't think it was going to be, I didn't think it was going to be like this. Definitely not. I remember being very young and wanting to be a vet, but that was mainly just because I love animals and I just wanted to be around animals. Yeah. I'm not sure I was too interested in actually like the whole, you know, veterinary part, but I just wanted to be around animals. And so I just got a dog instead. I think that's a much better use of that emotion 
um, than being a bad vet because you wanted to be <laughs> able to pet puppies and be around animals. But both, so we all had different things coming on. And I think that's actually what another thing that has really aided us as a band is that we've all done other things first. Yeah. So when we got to actually stand on stage and do the thing we wanted to do, we were like, whatever we need to do so that we can continue doing this, let's do that. Whatever it is, let's do it because this is worth anything. So, yeah, I think that that maybe for us was a little bit different. I know Enda was like, you know, worked as a health inspector. Um, and then this Fergal who you can throw, a, throw something at Fergal and he'll learn how to do it. He's a great photographer, great videographer. Yeah. He's, an, he's a really great engineer. And so he had, a, a, we all had our own stuff going on. So it was, it wasn't like we needed, if that makes sense, if that's a, yep. again, to maybe use the analogy of a relationship, you know, when, if you're single and you're really looking for a relationship and you can really never meet anyone like that. Right. And as soon as you're like, you know what, I might be done with dating. I just want to be by myself for a couple of years. I'm going to travel. At that exact moment, the love of your life walks in. Yeah. And I think that in terms of the band, that's the same thing that happened. We were all happy doing our own thing. And, and the band kind of pulled us out. Again, Martin left a PhD yeah. <laughs> to, to be in the band. Whatever about my mother uh, and father forgiving me for dropping out of college, dragging your older brother out of college is a, a, a total separate offense um, but it's worked <laughs> and it's been great so what was the how did the you guys just come together what made you know was there a meeting and say hey, we let's mm. let's try this or was it how did that really gel how did that come together i think it kind of fell together in ways again or the word organic tends to be quite a theme in our band. Yeah. Me and Enda and Martin, we thought alongside one another at, you know, different camps and being all banjo players, we had very deep connection. Um, and actually, when I left college first, uh, I lived with Fergal for years and we did 10 to 12 gigs a week wow. at, uh, for about eight months of the year together. Yeah. Uh, me and Martin have been playing gigs together since we were children, obviously. I think our first, our first, proper paid gig was when I was nine, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. You know, in Lynn Ann's bar in County Clare, <laughs> if people know where that is. Yeah. It's a hot spot. But we did a Friday night gig there for like probably money. We probably, I don't know, even know if we got paid. I don't know if I got paid, but that was our first gig. So we, we, we've all been playing music together in different ways for years. And then Enda and me and Martin sat around Enda's kitchen table with three banjos. We just started playing music. And I remember that being the kind of moment of, oh, there's something, again, touching on our earlier points of like, there's something weird about this. Yeah. You know, there's something weird and in the good way. And we did Galway Arts Festival, a very big, a big arts festival in our home city of Galway. Yeah. Um, and we got a gig there, lunchtime concert in the Roisin Dove. And we thought, sure, our parents will show up and it'll be nice to like, you know, have a show and we'll have a gig. Yeah. And it, it sold out. It sold out on, we had never done a gig. Nobody knew who we were. We had no videos, nothing. Nobody even knew who we were. They just saw the name We Banjo 3. And I'm pretty sure people were like, that sounds weird. I might go see that. Yeah. And so, in that thing of like, it wasn't just the path of least resistance. It was like, it was something that kind of drew us in. Um, so the actual original lineup of the band was just me, Enda and Fergal. Yeah. Or sorry, me, Enda and uh, Martin was the original lineup of the band. And then we got asked to come and play Milwaukee Irish Festival um, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Yeah. And well, actually we begged, could we come and play? And then they were like, okay. And then we were like, oh shit, we didn't really think, we didn't think you'd say yes. <laughs> um, and we were like, How are we, we have to do two hour shows. <laughs> yeah. we, we have exactly like five pieces of music to play. So we have to put together this show. And we knew that, we knew that something was missing in the band. We always knew that even in those early days, we knew that there was something not like, there wasn't, it was like having all the, the, the pieces of the Ikea table, but you didn't, like nobody packed like the, 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 the screws or the yeah. glue. Yeah. And then as soon as, 
as soon as like Fergal came in and played with us, it was like, okay, now now it makes sense. Now this now this like joins together and fits together, and we did that first weekend, uh, maybe two thousand and twelve uh, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, the first gig we played, there was probably eight people there who were lost. You know, probably <laughs> did, had, were on their way to the toilet and ended up in a wee bunch of three gig. And then by the end of the weekend, there was like 1,500 to 2,000 people trying to ram their way into this tiny little tent. Wow. And we were like, okay, this this has something. And it's not based, again, that wasn't based on us having this perfect music or having this plan. plan. We were just really enjoying it. And I think that if I was to look at why the band has stayed going and why it meant so much to us is that at every step, it's always been guided by, are we having fun? Yeah. That's a really good question to ask, I think. And I would hazard that it's like probably the most important question to ask as a band is like, are we still having fun? Yeah. This is not, cause it's not a business model. Like music is not a, no, like, there's no career guidance no. <laughs> counselor in any high school in the world. It's like, hey, you want to make a ton of money? You should be a musician. That sounds like a great idea. No one's saying that. It's a terrible idea to be a musician monetarily. You'll be away all the time. Your life will be fragmented and you'll, you know, have to deal with fragmented relationships and have to try and find a way to make it fit in your life. Yeah. It's not an easy fit. But when you just have... When there was so, so much joy, that's what we couldn't resist. And to this day, that's what's fueled the band. You know, we go out there and we just have fun. Sometimes we, sometimes we don't even like, like I've written, uh, I write the set lists usually. Yeah. Just kind of sit before the show and write down. I don't think we've ever followed one. Oh yeah. I don't think that we've ever actually played through a full set list without veering wildly off course at some point yeah <laughs> which is a sign of, like you're yeah, actually good. in it still you know yeah. you're not just paint, painting by numbers they're written you can paint by numbers they're written in front of you but if you're if you still have the want to like oh man you know what we haven't played in a while let's do that one that's that's the magic for us anyway so yeah, yeah. i feel lucky to be able to say that because the audience does know when the band is having a great time um and that, mm. that translates. Um, they understand that uh, 100%. And Maybe that's why they like the terrible drummer. Yeah, I know. Maybe that's why they love the terrible drummer, you know? Well, because it looked like, like he was having a great guy, time. He, he's <laughs> awful, but he's having the time of his life. Yeah. You know, that's that's a really good point. Yep. Yeah. That's a good point. The audience, they do know when you're having a good time. Yeah, they certainly do. So what, it's a, what is it like... Uh, obviously, America playing uh, in the U.S. Is, would be, I would assume, drastically different or somewhat different from playing uh, in Ireland. What, what's the biggest difference do you, do you find between the two? Ah, uh, wow. I think there's, lots, there's probably lots of differences that would seem logical. And I think there's one that a lot of people that I've never thought about until this very moment, it's probably more of a difference in me than them. Oh, yeah. When I play in America, I am an Irishman abroad. I am foreign. I'm exotic. I come from somewhere else. I don't need to fit in because I don't. Yeah. And I've lived here for, I've lived away from Ireland for nearly seven years, which I've turned 30 this year, which is quite a, quite a large portion of my life. Yeah. Um, and I've gotten used to that idea. I've gotten extremely used to being the other guy. I've gotten used to being foreign. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I just think it's interesting. And so maybe if I was to be honest uh, and try and pull out like what is different, most likely it's probably me. I'm, I'm different yeah. because when I stand in stage in America, I stand on stage and again, it's that lack of comparison. I'm not looking out into the audience at all these people who are like me. I'm looking out into the audience in my perce perception as people who are very different to me. And so I can just lean into those differences. It can be nerve wracking to play shows in Ireland. It can be 
really hard to stand in front of people that you know, uh, like teachers, old teachers of mine come to shows all the time in Ireland. Oh, yeah. Terrifying. Yeah. I'm like, you remember me when, like, I, you know, threw a pen at Clancy's, the back of Clancy's head in, you know, fourth year. You know, you kicked me out of your class because I wouldn't stop talking. Like, that yeah. kind of stuff. That's, like, I, it's, that for me is... And I think that maybe that extends to the entire, my entire psychological kind of um, experience of, of playing shows in Ireland. It's, it's nerve wracking. I, there's a lot, of, there's a lot in it for me because I really want those. I really want, and maybe it'll change if I lived, if I lived in Ireland again properly, maybe that would change because I want them to accept me way more than I want to be accepted when I'm here. Yeah. When I mean, when I'm somewhere else, we play Japan a lot as well, playing South America and you all around Europe and yeah. Canada and you know America and all of those times. I don't, I don't, I struggle at times with the need for acceptance, but nothing like the what I feel when I'm at home. When I'm at home, I just it's it can be really difficult not to fall into that chasm and feel like oh, I need these people to accept me. I need I need these people to see me and like think that I'm real. Yeah. Um, so I I don't I don't know I know I know there's probably a lot of artists that you've I'm sure you've asked that question to lots of people and they have the answers that are probably more about the audience. But for me, it's much more about the reflection of myself and what how I am, and that's a, probably a struggle for me to try and like maintain my authenticity in that in yeah. that space. You know? Yeah, because when you're in us you don't have a whole lot to compare yourself against you know it's not as if you have you know you you are different right because you have an accent and you come from ireland and people are you're exotic to people right um it's like i've looked at shows i mean obviously tribute shows are big i can take a um a roy orbison tribute show uh from toronto uh, and uh, maybe one from Milwaukee, one from Australia. The Australian one could be the worst one, but I could I could say direct from Australia, you know, tribute to Roy Orbison and bring it to Canada, and it will outsell all the rest of them, just because it says direct from Australia on it. People are like, wow, yeah. from Australia, you know. Um, exotic right it's there's something about that or else uh i tour a lot of shows uh that may be vegas based so i you know promo direct from las vegas is this and yeah. just saying that alone will drive people to a show and hopefully they have an entertaining show mm -hmm. and, and it's great but it's the same of course, yeah. kind of thing it's and when something's different from what you're used to um People are super interested in that. Um, and then when it's great yeah. on top of it, um, it's a, like a double bonus. So, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. And I hope that, go ahead. I, I hope that that's the trajectory of the entire world. Like I would hope that when we don't know something, when we don't, when we are maybe not as familiar with something that our response to it is interest. That would be like if you put that on the whole world stage, like politics, culture, cuisine. If you put that on the whole, like that's a beautiful way to enter the world. To be so, like when I moved here, when I moved to Nashville, I was so curious. But when I moved to New Hampshire, I didn't even know what I was getting into. I'd really, I think we've played like a couple of shows here, been through here a couple of times, but I knew nothing about New Hampshire, like nothing. Yeah, and I, my. I had such a great time here because it's it's like oh and I, I mean we're in the midst of a very interesting time but when when you when you can have curiosity for something it's it's really a gift it's like it opens things in a way that that is just really fun to live that life and I so I think in in what you're saying when you have these direct from enter country name I I, I think that's a really great want for the entire world is that that's how we treat difference. That's how we treat something that's with like, oh, I'm interested to know how that works. Or, oh, I'm, I'm interested to know what that is. Yeah. Rather than fear. Fear is the other side of that coin, I suppose. Yeah. And in the opposite side of that, 
you could be saying, you know, direct from down the road. <laughs> it's such and such. And people are like, ah, oh. <laughs> you know, no, they're only local. And and that's the other thing you have to deal with is sort of like if you're if you're local, it's hard to get out of the fact that you're just local, um, even though yeah. you could be the best thing in the world everywhere else. And and maybe that's exactly what I that ties in exactly with like playing in your home country, you know? Yeah. Particularly if it's a, a hyper local country like Canada, big place, America, big place, Ireland. It's big, like in terms of my experience of it, but in comparison, it's it's a small, smaller place. Like you're more likely to be in a town in Ireland. Like we always have this joke where people are like, oh, you're from Ireland. Do you know Paddy from this yeah. place? And your first, your first response is to be deeply offended <laughs> by the fact that someone is like, how dare you? You think that I come from this tiny island that we know, oh, Paddy. Oh, yeah, Paddy. Yeah, I know Paddy. Yeah, sure, of course I know. Like, there's these two things that you're offended that they would think that your country's so small that you know everyone. But you're also, yeah, you actually do know that person they're talking about. Which So <laughs> Ireland's kind of like that. It's, it's, it's more of a localized community, particularly the music community as well. Um, like, I've never been more excited about the music that's coming out of Ireland than yeah. I am right now. It's, I, I think it's... I think it's amazing what's happening. Do you have in Ireland, and I should know this, but I don't, um, like in Canada, we certainly have our East Coast, which is very Celtic and Irish and fiddle mm. and um, music uh, from the East. But then you get into Ontario yeah. when it's just kind of straight up metropolitan, um, you, you know, American type of base. Then you get to the West and it's, it's different again. Um, do you, in Ireland, do you have regions where it's felt, feels musically d drastically different from different areas? Yeah, yeah, yes and no. I think, I think yes, in terms of there's definitely difference and, but I think it's a much, it's probably a very subtle difference, like within Within the country, I, I think that there's there's definitely a lot of music happening, new music happening, yeah. and it's happening all over. But if you go back a little bit, and if you really dig into kind of the historical edge of music in Ireland, the the regions are really different. Like the way Fergal plays fiddle is very different to the way someone from Donegal would play fiddle. Oh yeah. So it's really specific in terms of that. I mean, I always marvel at the fact that there's three different versions of the Irish language that I, like there's many different but there's three big ones on the west coast there's like Munster Irish there's Connacht Irish which is where I'm from and there's um, there's the Donegal style Irish and they're totally different yeah they're totally different and I always think that that so yes the, the, the music styles do vary but I don't think it's maybe as extreme as Canada I remember you know Coulter Wall kind of a Canadian country musician. What's the name again? He's this like Coulter Wall. Hmm. We no, played, I don't. We played Calgary Folk Fest a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, we played Calgary Folk Fest a couple of years ago. Great, had a great time. And I remember meeting Coulter Wall. Yeah. He's the, his voice is like the deepest, most resonant, like I think when he speaks, like cliffs in the distance sheer off yeah. from the vibrations. <laughs> like so deep. Yeah, and he has the like he's a he's a like he's a rancher, an actual rancher. Yeah, and I met this guy immediately in my head. I was like, "You're from Texas." I was like, "This guy's from Texas, definitely." And he was like, "I'm from Canada." And I was like, "Wow, I never knew that. I never knew that there was this." I ne like, you know, you spend all this time, you know, traveling around, and you just never. There's some things you just never see, and it was only at that moment I realized that there was a whole country and Western scene in Canada in yeah. that kind of Ontario gap that you're talking about. And that's what I think is fantastic about music and the world and where we're at right now as well is that like those scenes are they're, they, they those, what would be kind of seen as niche markets yeah. and niche scenes have really thundered up. They've really risen up, you know, you have, and I mean, it is from, again, there's a dance with the devil because it is from, the Spotify, Apple Music, Facebook, Instagram world. 
is that you don't need to be on a major label for people to hear your music all over the world anymore. That That's not an, a necessity. You can put something on SoundCloud and send a link to someone on a different planet, almost. Yeah. If Elon Musk gets his way, he'll be able to do that. Yeah. And and I think that that's, that's really exciting musically because it ju- it means that you can just actually be your authentic self and there's probably a million people in the world that want to listen to that music and they don't all have to be in the same place. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Like, I think that's like, because then it actually allows for that music to have a life, not just in a, in a place, but in, in, in the whole world. So you can be Coulter Wall, live in Ontario and travel around the world. But people from like, there's a huge country and Western scene in Ireland. Like people in Ireland love that music. Oh yeah. But m- nobody knows that. Like I know I have so many friends who've gone to Ireland and they were like, we went to Ireland and we went around to all the pubs and a lot of it was country music and we were really shocked. I'm like, yeah, that's it's really popular there. Irish people love that. I did a, I a lot of... I, I pret- no, I, I was just going to say, I, I did a lot of work with Charlie Pride in Canada, did uh, production for all of his tours and stuff, and and he's huge in Ireland. He always go there and tour, and and a big star in Ireland, Charlie Pride. You know? I know, it's great. Yeah. I, I love that stuff. Like, I, I think I get so tickled by it because it's... It's just the type of weirdness the world needs. Yeah, exactly. You know, you don't need to be logically because if if it without it, what what would happen is that if you want to be a country musician, you have to go and live where the country musicians live, and if you want to be an Irish musician, you have to live where the Irish music is wanted to be listened to. And I love the idea that there's like there's a massive Irish scene for Celtic music in Japan. Again, first time we were there, it blew my mind. Yeah, you walk into a Irish pub in Osaka and there's like a bunch of Japanese people playing the Bucks of Ward Moore and you're like what is happening but it's that's just the magic of how connective music is you know yeah in Irish music it just it's it's hard not to like it right it's it's fun I mean it's just driving it's it's there's you know the ballads are really heartfelt um it, it's one of those styles of music where you don't really need to understand what the person's singing necessarily to feel what the song's about yeah. right um where other styles you know you really have to grab onto what the lyric is and that um you know obviously it's important but the musicality i find of irish music is so strong where it's like i don't need to know what you're particularly saying or singing about because it's being brought out so strong by the instrumentation, whether it's a fast, you know, tune, mid tune or, or a ballad, but you know, even ballads just, you know, you could make you weep without knowing what the song's about because it's just translating so well. Yeah. I, 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 and I think that again, that's part of the magic of being in a band that's a crossover where, you know, you can get to play that music every night. I mean, one of my favorite things to play is Marry Me Monday. It's a tune that Fergal wrote for uh, his wife, Ruth, yeah. on the day they got married. It's just it's just a melody. There's no words. And man, you can, but you can understand the message of that tune way better than like some of the other stuff that has words. Yeah. Because you're right, like the, the emotion of the melody is so... When you when you can write a tune that moves someone, that's like, that's amazing. Like if you can move someone with just pure melody, that I feel like is, that's me. And again, leaning into that side of music, that's not about technicality. That's not about your ability to play. It's about your sense of being able to play with some, some soul. You know. Yeah. Yeah, you have to be able to dig deep, um, and just be able to pour that out and I mean I know you talked about producing earlier and um, I mean part of a producer's job that's what it is is trying to dig that out of somebody when they're doing a performance whether it's a ballad or something you need to get that gusto out however you can do it you know I've sat in the studio and and had a client who couldn't deliver a ballad properly and then we just went down a rabbit hole and we 
I asked about what was the saddest moment of your life. And, and, you know, we talked about her grandmother passing away and when she was in tears and, and, uh, we just kind of finished talking and I said, like, all right, let's sing. And, uh, she was like, I can't sing. I said, yes, you can. Um, and bam, first take done. Um, cause she was, had to take her to that place where, you know, we sure you could deliver that type of emotion. Yeah. Um, and it's, that's a difficult mm-hmm. thing is some people can tap, you know, bam, they can take themselves right there. Right. Um, and other people, um, have a tough time, either they're closed off or just haven't had enough experience to know what that feels like. Um, so they can't take themselves to some place they haven't experienced before. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's an inter- interesting <laughs> job being a producer because it's, it's not really knowing what to play. It's knowing, um, how to get the person to play it. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's the thing. Yeah. I think it's really, I think it's a really deep role for in music is, is a producer's role because what you do in the space of a band is again, you're getting these people into a room to record, like to like print digitally print their performance. Yeah. It's something that will be, like listen back to millions of times and you're you're trying to get a musician <laughs> to do that without freaking out that they're not good enough you're like the like the the magic that that takes is is exceptional you know yeah so yeah my, if, my hat is off to all of you producer engineers well i've been stuck on the other side job. where where i've been a session guy and and just couldn't you know had it producer wanted me to play fiddle on something and I was just got stuck on my brain that couldn't quite get what they wanted and and uh it was basically I just kind of stopped and said can I just come back tomorrow and do it and and it was like yeah yeah no problem and came back next day bam first take done um and that was it and it was just like I just need to clear my head um because you just kind of was getting the same thing. You were, you you felt uptight for some reason, or you couldn't quite get what they wanted, so you were getting frustrated with yourself, and you just you you just go down a rabbit hole, and you just can't get yourself out. And you just sometimes you just got to walk away and reapproach it a day later. Yeah. Happens. Mm. So, um, we banjo three. Obviously, we're in this pandemic, and we're obviously not touring around all over the place. Um, Hopefully we're out of this, um, you know, not too long a future, but what's, what's on the horizon for, for your group? We are, we are always scheming. That's another thing I love about being in this band is that there's, we're all, we're just trying to always find things to do with ourselves. We're not very good at relaxing or resting. So, yeah. um, we've been doing a lot of like virtual, uh, live stream concerts and, kind of collection of artists um we've had a number we've done a number of them that have been really successful so far and we've really enjoyed doing um and on the 13th of march we're doing another one which is the very first time that we will sit in a room together and play live wow um a year so the last time the last show we had was march 13th last year yeah uh, 2020 and i am flying back to ireland I'm going to quarantine and take some PCR tests and be safe uh, in terms of COVID. And then the very first time that I'll see the lads, we are going to sit down in a gorgeous, gorgeous distillery in Dublin, yeah. Fish Lines Distillery, and we're going to play a show for people. Um, awesome. uh, so all the tickets and all that stuff are at We Bench of Three, obviously. But it's it's exciting and nerve wracking because we have obviously been doing a lot of recording and a lot of kind of idea creation and we've been we've virtually played together quite a lot but yeah. the actual act of s- sitting in a room with one another and playing is we haven't done that in a full year which is the longest time we've ever been apart it's wow. the longest time i've ever been apart from martin in my entire life yeah in nearly 30 years in nearly 30 years i've never i've i've not me and martin have never been apart for more than maybe two months yeah. three months maybe most so this has been a very strange time so that's kind of what's on the future for us 
um, there's a new album in the in the writing as well. Um, we've been spending a lot of the time off the road in this in this in this particular moment doing that. And that's been really great. And even to do that in this space has been very interesting. It's very different to write an album on the road uh, as writing an album, not having the possibility of playing it on a stage to test out the song. It's like yeah. you just a very different thing. So we've lots of exciting stuff. And, and honestly, it's 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 the the whole pandemic. That should be another red button moment. Every time someone says the pandemic, <laughs> no. or we should have some whiskey. Yeah. should be kind of rules around saying the word pandemic. Um, it's made me more thankful and more grateful than ever for this band. I, I think that maybe possibly, if I'm to be brutally honest, uh, before the pandemic, I, I, I don't think I really appreciated what we had. I didn't appreciate walking out in front of, you know, people every night who would sing our songs back to us and smile and laugh at our terrible jokes and you know send us beautiful messages after shows and i didn't appreciate the love and support that i get from my bandmates i didn't appreciate the magic of playing live with somebody every night yeah being able to make it up or do something wrong i didn't appreciate the mistakes becoming the interesting parts i didn't appreciate that as much as i do right now i think when this is all over, I hope that I can hang on to the feelings that I have right now. I hope all of us can hang on to the feelings we have right now of how lucky we were and how special it is to be able to do what we do. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's a gift, not a given. Yeah. There's part of it. It's like a reset, right? Where we we really, I think a lot of us needed to reset and kind of look back and, and, really figure out what we had and like you said and it's it's we take advantage um everything you know everything's so easy you know you can hop online and watch anything you want you can go anywhere and do anything you want and and you took just took it for advantage and uh that you know is always going to be there right just being able to hop on a cruise ship and go out somewhere for a week and you know that was just nothing right now you take it all away Hopefully we can hang on to the fact that, you, you know, you, you get a couple of days away somewhere. That's pretty awesome. You get to do a show in front of a bunch of people. How awesome is that? Because, you know, you, I think it's for everything. You, you take all that stuff away and then you realize what's really was important and really, really means a lot to you and, and not to take, uh, yeah. take it for granted. So, um, totally. yeah, I, I don't We'll, we'll wrap up uh, here with a couple of quick questions. Um, it's been a great podcast and really enjoyed talking with you. And uh, yeah, been, thank you. the uh, one question I always like to ask a lot of musicians, is there uh, a place out there that you've never performed at a venue or a city or a country that you've always wanted to perform if you haven't had the chance yet? Oh, wow. There's a... You you really you really start with the good ones, don't you? You really start with the easy <laughs> questions. <laughs> where's the where's the venue that you want to? Where's your dream venue? Yeah, you know, I would love to play at Mother Church in Nashville, um, the Ryman Theater. Yeah, uh, the Ryman Auditorium is. I've seen everything from the Punch Brothers to Death Cab for Cutie there. Uh, you know, I've seen a lot of amazing shows in that venue. Um. And I think it's got real magic, and I and I would love to see We Banjo Three play there. I think that would be a dream. I was lucky enough to. Uh, I've been performing with my family for my whole life, uh, with my, my brother, my sister. My mom plays bass, and my dad played drums. He's passed away now, but we've been a country band for mm-hmm. forever, and we got to do our own show at the Ryman uh, ten years ago now. Oh, wow. And uh, yeah, I always really? tell tell the story because I'm the also the tech guy in the band. So set up and rehearsal and sound checks and stuff. I was really busy making sure everything was rocking and you, you kind of get up and it wasn't until I was maybe seven songs in where it finally just kind of hit me. It's like, Holy crap. I'm actually playing a show here. Um, and it was like, bam, it hit me like, like a ton of bricks. <laughs> it was funny. The other story too, it was funny about it. Uh, our steel guitar player, 
uh, one of my best friends and Ed, he was playing with us. And I, I remember being about three songs in and I, I'm thinking to myself, gosh, I haven't heard, I haven't heard much steel going on. What's, you know, what's going on. And then I found out, yeah, I think it was either that night or the next day that he was, I wouldn't say freaked out, but he was so taken in by the fact he was doing a show that he barely played for the first three songs. <laughs> then, then basically got into it. But I still remember, it's like, there's not much steel going on. <laughs> but yeah, it's a pretty magical place. So the the last question I, I'll i leave on, uh, it's, it's, it's turning into a fun question uh, for a lot of musicians. Obviously, being on the road um, and being able to travel, uh, one of the, the things that's, I usually find the next best thing to playing the gig is where are you going to eat afterwards or during the tour? Uh, do you have a favorite, yeah. do you have a favorite spot or favorite food that you have to have whenever you go to a city? Yes, I do actually. And uh, the first one that pops into my head is Milwaukee, Wisconsin. There is a place called St. Paul's fish market in, in the third ward. Yeah. Um, and there's a, a, a guy called Patrick who runs the tiki bar outside. And if you are ever in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, I can, I actually promise you this. If you're in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and you end up at that tiki bar and Patrick is your bartender, tell him that I sent you, please. It will make his day. <laughs> he, I have sat at that bar. Oh man, we've played Milwaukee, I think eight seven or eight times in a row yeah. and each time we like book a week we usually take a week off before that festival and we just hang out in milwaukee yeah i've spent weeks sitting at that bar <laughs> you know and if food is fantastic the the i hands down for me the best bully mary in the world I'll give you a little you know the little half pint of schlitz as well but which really tops it off yeah um but the food's amazing but i think that that is like that's a place. That's a hang. Uh, you sit there at that bar. You meet the most interesting people. Patrick himself, the guy who runs it, is the most interesting person I've ever met. He's a you know fishes deep sea fisherman and you know this big gray beard and just yeah. fantastic person. So if I was to pick out one part, one place that I did on my on my travels that sticks out as a as a a must go, St. Paul's Fish Market, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Tiki Bar, have a Bloody Mary, just do it it'll change your life awesome that's I, honestly there's a part of me that's when all this is over like that might be one of the first places that i might get on a plane yeah like they're like you know they put up in the morning hey pandemic's over you can do whatever you want i might fly to milwaukee like it's that important <laughs> that's awesome well i appreciate um the hang here in the conversation what's the best way to for people to uh, follow We Banjo 3, obviously, webanjo3.com, uh, uh, Instagram, and Facebook. Yeah, Instagram, Facebook, webanjo3.com. And a big part of it for us is we're a fan powered band. We've been from the very beginning, we're an independent band. We've never had a label, we've never had anything. So we just love to get to know people. Um, so if there's any of your listeners that have listened to this and go and find us, whatever the latest post we put up, drop a comment in there and say where you found us and tell us that it was from this. We'd love to get to know you because I think music for, for me, and I think I can speak for the entire band, music is about the people. It's about the connection between us and the people we get to play for every night. And we're very, very thankful for that. So thanks for having me. This has been really fun. I've, I haven't really, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting thing to ha like, you know, to meet people and to hang out in, a global pandemic this yeah. has been a really enjoyable conversation i really enjoyed it so thank you awesome yeah i feel the same way it's uh you know some people you can ha just have great conversations with and you have certain things in common and and uh yeah uh, i really really enjoyed this one so appreciate it hopefully we get to uh hang maybe sometime in milwaukee at the tiki bar <laughs> that'd be fun yeah if i go if i go missing <laughs> if if i just disappear off the face of the planet that's probably where you should ch you should probably just check the tiki bar in Milwaukee first. That's probably where I am. Yeah, With people are wondering. Phone. I'll just write. Yeah, I know where he is. <laughs> well, 
Well, just hang on a second. Uh, we'll say proper goodbye. Uh, but uh, I want to thank you again for being on the podcast and and make sure everyone check out uh, Rebangel Three. Uh, some great videos online too, um, and you know, just an enjoyable watch. And it's you know, even watching the videos is you feel like you're there at a show. Um, really, really, really awesome band. So thanks again, and uh, we'll chat with you soon. Oh, <laughs>